he is jealous for me Love's like a hurricane, I am a tree Bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. And oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. How
Thanks, Stevie. How are you guys doing this morning? Good. Me too. Um, I don't know about you. This is the kind of September I always look for every year, and it's never there. Um, I'm always like burning up and running my AC too much. So this actually feels like proper, like, hey, we're coming into fall. So look at us, San Diego. Um, well, if you, uh, just a couple things. You, um, as you, we hear about four services, uh, one of the reasons is in the evening we did that is just because kind of what you're experiencing here. Um, and some of you guys have addressed like, well, what about the morning? What are we doing in terms of the growth and the kids space and things like that? And I want to invite you back uh, next week. You'll hear a little bit more specifically about what we're doing in terms of kids ministry that I'm really excited about. But we're going to be having another, what we call just Future Sunday. We just talk about the vision of the church, where we're going. Um, right now, the slotted to be October 8th. And so if you're just like curious, like, hey, what, you know, where are we going? What are we doing in terms of response to what God's doing and moving here? Uh, we are going to be addressing those things, and I'm really excited for that. So make sure you just mark your calendar for that. But like Stevie said, we just kicked off a brand new series last week on spiritual formation that will carry us through Thanksgiving. And uh, it's one that we have been talking about, praying for, uh, for months and months and months. And so it feels really exciting for us as a teaching team and as a staff for it to finally be here. And so let me kind of set the table in terms of what, what this looks like, why we're excited about this. When I grew up, I grew up going to a church that was vibrant and healthy and good. Um, I grew up with parents who loved the Lord. And as I went about my life, there was... Um, if you were to ask me what sort of rhythms and habits form my spiritual life, I would have pointed to going to church on Sunday, uh, having a, what we called quiet time or devotional um, that was semi-consistent, um, and then maybe like going to, for me it was a youth group or maybe a small group or things like that. And that, and that, was, that was pretty much it. That, that made up the rhythm of my spiritual life. And I, I didn't think much of it. Uh, but what I found as I grew up and grew older is that there is, although those three things, you know, my, our version of a quiet time, attending Sunday gathering, uh, finding yourself around a table, those are essential and those are very much a part of the spiritual life. Uh, there was so much more that Jesus was inviting me into in, ter in terms of the formation of my spirit. And we look at that and we get that language and that idea by looking at the person of Jesus. And you'll notice that when Jesus invites people into, uh, in, into his belief in him, he doesn't give them kind of a small list of things to do. He doesn't really even give them the things that they wish that he would believe. He gives them this very staggering statement that is all-encompassing. He says this, follow me. His invitation is a full-on lifestyle shift. And that's the invitation he gives in all four Gospels. It's the invitation he gives to everyone who becomes seriously inviting into. And, and what we've realized is in the Western church, we've kind of separated this idea of being a Christian and being a disciple or being a follower. But Jesus never really makes that delineation. His invitation is a full lifestyle reorientation around the way of Jesus. And so this fall, what we're trying to do is, as a church and as individuals, is to ask ourselves, what does that invitation look like in 2023? If Jesus were to show up in your life, your job, your family, your sphere of influence, and say, would you follow me? What would change? What would shift? What sort of rhythms and habits would you start? And what sort of rhythms and habits would you stop? And in order for us to do this, we're going to be looking at two different disciplines each Sunday leading up to Thanksgiving. And the idea is not that you become a master at all of them. The idea is that as we present, and, this, and even the ones we're presenting, this is not an exhaustive list, list. Just read the life of Jesus and look at certain patterns and rhythms that he does. But the idea is as you look at, certain, at these different themes, disciplines, patterns that we do, our hope and prayer as a, as a leadership team, as a pastoral team, is that you may be able to grab a handful of them and use them to kind of reorient your life. And at the same time, look at things not only that you're adding, but things that you're actually relinquishing, things that you're letting go. And so this is our, our attempt is that 
in, in 2023, we, we don't need more Christian activity. We need more apprentices of Jesus. And so we do that by saying, Lord, we, you have our whole life. And inadvertently, you have our whole spirit. And so John 15, 5 is kind of our, our focal point for this fall. And it's Jesus. And he says, I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him It is he that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Father Jaquez Philippe writes this, The fundamental problem of our spiritual life becomes this. How can I let Jesus act in me? And how can I permit the grace of God to freely operate in my life? I just love that last sentence. How do I let the grace of God freely operate in my life? And what um, many incredible wise men and women throughout hundreds of years of church history, uh, they summarize this is through just the phrase, and it's, this is not a biblical phrase, but rather it's an, a, it's an observation of what Jesus invites us into. It's a spiritual formation. Robert Mulholland defines it like this. And this is the definition we're using throughout the series. It is the process of being formed into the image of Christ for the sake of others. If you missed last week, I would highly encourage you to go back and watch it. It's a little bit of a primer for this entire series. Um, But that's our goal, is that we would begin to be in a process of being formed into the image of Christ for the sake of others, that we would be connected to Jesus. And this this week, we're going to be diving into one that you really, most of us really don't have an option to choose. And so it's kind of why we're beginning with these. We're going to be talking about work and rest. And so I want to show you guys some images that I found in an article that Washington posted. They kind of divvied up our life in terms of how much you spend your life doing what. Um, some of it may make sense to you. Some of it might be shocking. So let me show you kind of the first image. Um, and so this is your life in terms of marbles filling up your jar. Uh, you'll notice that uh, the pink, the most of your life will be spent in bed. It's good news. Some of you guys are like, who says who? Right? Uh, The next biggest section is work. What you do is a vocation. And then the next biggest is screen time, which is a little bit depressing. Um, And then it goes from eating, holidays, romance, socializing, exercise, school, and then the rest. And so I want to just give a, a quick note on the top three. So first, let's just talk about the number one thing you will do with your life, believe it or not, is rest, is sleep. So here's a couple of things on sleep. Um, in total, if you were to calculate that in terms of years, as 26 years of your life is spent sleeping. And, and so a couple of things before you're just like, man, what a waste of time. Think about this. A, we need this because it boosts boosts our mental health, improves our physical well-being, it helps our immunity. And then then the next thing that we do is after sleep is that we actually move into uh, our work or our vocation. This is 13 years of our life. Um, Again, this is if you calculated all the days. This is not including time off. And um, some of you guys are like, wouldn't that be more? Well, if you think about the time you had in school, the time after you retire, 13 years of your life, on average, is spent working. And then the last one, and probably the most depressing for all of us, is 11 years of your life uh, will be spent on screens. Eight years of that on TV, and three years of that on social media. Um, I remember hearing uh, one time that if you spend, um, because you know what's funny about the 9 a.m. service? If you have an iPhone, you all get an update of how much screen time you've used this week. (laughs) If you, are, if you are on your phone, let's just say social media, if you're on social media two hours a day, it's simple math, that's a month of your year. Every, every year, a month of your life is spent on social media. And so with just some of those just very preliminary statistics in terms of what we do in terms of sleep and then work and then the media that consumes our time, It's not surprising to me that as a pastor, oftentimes when I'm sitting down with someone over coffee, if I'm talking to someone in the lobby, I'm meeting with people who are dealing with exhaustion. I'm dealing with people who are trying to squeeze more into that waking time that they have, that they're trying to fully live into the life that they could. 
And as a result of that, there's a level of spiritual exhaustion. Ken Shigematsu, who's a Japanese theologian, um, in his book, God in My Everything, uh, makes this interesting observation that the Chinese character uh, for busy is actually two symbols put together. And it's the symbol for heart and death. And so the Chinese symbol for busy is a death of heart, which I find a, a kind of an interesting word picture of what happens when we become busy, which is exactly where, where we're in. I just want to read you a few statistics. Uh, we work more than ever before. We make up 22% of the global economy, even though we only have 4% of the world's population. California alone puts out over $2 trillion a year. That's more than the entire GDP of Italy. And California has 37% fewer people. Since 1950, the per capita income of America has tripled. The average size of an American home has gone up by almost 1,000 square feet from 1,300 to 2,300. But the average size of the family has been cut in half from 4.3 to 2.5. But in spite of all this exponential growth, research shows that we're more unhappy than ever as a nation. It, ma it makes me think that there's a correlation between what we're all sensing and what the Israelites must have sensed when they were being rescued from Egypt. And they were being called out of a years and years and generations of being enslaved of working, putting together bricks to build the pyramids. And in the middle of that point of their story, they cry out to their God. God hears them and he sends Moses. Moses rescues them by the mighty hand of God out of Israel into the wilderness where God meets them in a profound way. And it's at this point where Moses is introduced to the leader, and this is what's fascinating. Moses is believed historically and traditionally to have written the first five books of the Bible, which is um, for the Jews is known as the Torah, uh, for us is known as the Pentateuch. But the first five books of the Bible, if in fact they were written by Moses, which most scholars would agree on, they were written to the Israelites, recently enslaved people, think of us, who had not had a day off in generations. Slaves don't have a day off. And so all they've ever known was toil and work. God rescues them and, builds and brings them into the wilderness, and he begins to start instructing them about who he is and what he's doing. And the very first thing that the people would read in their Torah, in their, in their Hebrew Bible, was a poem. It was a poem about creation, a poem about the kind of God that had rescued them. And I want to read maybe some familiar texts to you this morning, but I don't want you to read it as 21st century Westerners. I want you to read it through the lens of an ancient Hebrew who's just been rescued from slavery and trying to figure out what does it mean to be human again? What does it mean to have relationship with God? You see, this poem in Genesis chapter 1 is, is a poem about a relationship between a creator and his creation. It's a poem about the relationship between work and rest. And it's a poem about the relationship between space and time, which is really another way to talk about work and rest, is our relationship to space and time. What do we do with the space around us, and what do we do with the time that we've been given? Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, in his book, The Sabbath, talks about this. To gain control of the world of space is certainly one of our tasks. The danger begins when in gaining power in the realm of space, we forfeit all aspirations in the, in the realm of time. There is a realm of time where the goal is not to have, but to be. Not to own, but to give. Not to control, but to share. Not to subdue, but to be in accord. Life goes wrong when the control of space, the acquisitions of things of space, become our sole concern. So with that Hebrew, ancient Hebrew lens, I want to read the first opening chapter or two of Genesis 
And I want you to see how that would have hit you as someone just coming out of, talk about exhaustion, just coming out of generations of slavery. And as we read the word of God, would you stand to your feet with me as we honor the scriptures that are being read? Then God said, let us make mankind in our image according to our likeness, they will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. Genesis 2 says, So the heavens and the earth and everything in them were completed. And on the seventh day, God had completed his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, for on it he rested from all his work of creation. In verse 8, it says, The Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, where he placed the man he had formed. The Lord God caused to grow out of the ground every tree pleasing in appearance and good for food, including the tree of life in the middle of the garden, as well as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river went from Eden to the water to water the garden. From there it divided and became the sources of four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon, which flows through the entire land of Havila, where this is gold. Gold from that land is pure, beryllium and onyx and also there. The name of the second river is Gehon, which flows through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris, which runs east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to watch over it. You may be seated. A couple of quick things to point out. That would have been shocking and reorienting for the original audience. Number one, and you see it said multiple times, they were created to rule. (coughs) Human beings were created with a certain sense of divine dominion over the earth. That that poem is reinstating. Secondly, that God created a garden that was unfinished. He created a a space that had to be tended and worked worked in order for it to be cultivated. But also this poem is shocking, again, for his ancient audience, in that we have a God who rests. And that the seventh day was humanity's first day. So as God rests, our introduction as humanity is experiencing our true sense of existence is to rest with God in the midst of his creation. This would have been fundamentally backwards from everything they would have known. Now, we might not have been rescued from ancient Egypt. We may not know of Pharaoh, but the reality is every single one of us serves a type of Pharaoh. And so my hope this morning is that we'd be able to ask some serious questions about the kind of work and the kind of rest that we do. Are we still living in metaphorical Egypt? Or are we living back in the garden? This sermon is about being human. What does it mean to be fully human? And by being fully human, the the kind of human that God intended for us to be. And we can't answer that question without looking at the relationship between work and rest. And so I wanted to talk about some different themes around both of these. The first one is work. That the Bible informs us that work is for shaping, relationship, dignity, and worship. And that the Sabbath, or rest, is for stopping, resting, delight, and also worship. Let's begin the conversation around work. Tim Keller In his his excellent book on the subject, probably the best, it's called Every Good Endeavor, defines work like this. It is the rearranging of the raw materials of God's creation in such a way that it helps the world in general and people in particular thrive and flourish. It is the reordering of God's raw materials 
for the sake of the flourishing of others. In Genesis 2.15, it says, The Lord God took the man, placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to watch over it. So the narrative of Scripture begins in a garden, but if you fast forward to the very last book of the Bible, we see that it ends in a city. It's kind of like a garden city. And if you were to take a, a wild garden in a city, what that takes is cultivation. That is essentially our vocation. It's our invitation to work and to begin to be a part of that. And so despite what kind of vocation you have, what kind of work you do, the chances are you are participating in that whether you knew it or not. You are shaping culture towards something. And for the Christian idea around work is that we are to be shaping culture towards a better vision of new creation. And that could look like all sorts of things. If you're an electrician, And you're literally rerouting energy to allow there to be lights to be on and for people to flourish in their companies and their businesses and homes. Maybe you're a nurse and you are literally mending broken bodies and caring for the sick. Teachers who are, you're forming thought and you're forming skill. Entrepreneurs who see what does not exist in the future and create solutions for existing problems. Mothers who guide the character and the potential of their children. Designers who organize just three primary colors into variants of thousands of lines and tell a story through beauty. Musicians arranging just 12 notes in different shapes and patterns to evoke emotion. Builders taking the worlds of natural materials and elements to create shelter, roads, and hospitals. Lawyers, we're not sure what you do, but um, I'm sure that there is a, a good redemptive thing. <laughs> I get my dad's a lawyer. I feel like I can say that. He's probably going to listen to this. But unfortunately, um, we have separated this, the sacred and the secular in terms of work. Like, oh, there's the people who work in ministry, and then there's pe- people who work in the marketplace. Really unhelpful terms because they're not biblical. The idea is you were created to work. And your work should be in alignment with the unique wiring that God has made you. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that you always are going to wake up and be like, I can't believe, I'm pinching myself, I can't believe I have this job. But it's rather the opposite. What if you looked at the job that you have as an invitation from the Lord to participate in His renewal of all things? What if you change the way that you say, I'm actually getting to shape culture towards new creation by what I do. Now, most jobs, you can do that. You can find the thread that's weaving in that thing. Now, granted, it's important part, there are jobs that are working against new creation. Um, uh, I, I, knew, I knew a guy years ago who got radically saved, uh, like out of a life. He, he owned most of the strip clubs in San Diego met Jesus, got rid of his businesses, and started doing e-commerce. And watching the, the very first thing he had to do is recognizing that there's nothing redemptive about what I'm doing. And then began to go into nonprofit work to actually go and redeem that thing that he at one point was actually trying to help flourish. And so it does not mean that every job is dignified or has kind of a redeemable thing. But, and so if you're working a job that you're like, this is not working towards new creation, this is time for you to pray to step out of that. But the chances are, if you are working a job that maybe you just feel is mundane, like you don't know what it is, pray. Say, Lord, what is my redeemable narrative within my job that is shaping culture towards new creation? The second thing you should know about your work is one of the reasons why it's redeemable and it's beautiful is because your work involves relationship. If your job involves relationship, there is potential there for redemption. Now, your job has a relationship not just with others, which we'll talk about here in a second. First and foremost, your job connects you in terms of your relationship with God. Tim Keller, again, in his book, says this, If the point of work is to serve and exalt ourselves, then our work inevitably becomes less about the work and more about us. Our aggressiveness will eventually become abuse or drive will become burnout and self-sufficiency will become self-loathing. Which is why Paul in Colossians says, You know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Probably the most simplistic way you can find redemptive value in your job is to change who your boss is. According to Colossians, 
It's not your supervisor. It's not the CEO. The minute you started following Jesus, Christ became the person you're serving. And so what would it look like for you to show up and say, Lord, this is for you today. I'm showing up to this job. And because I'm serving you, it changes how I work. Secondly, we have relationships with others. I mean, I think one of the the hardest points about COVID was because it removed our ability to work alongside the people around us. And even though some of us do that digitally and some of us work around people more than others, it's recognizing that God intended for us to work side by side. And even after Jesus came, there's something beautiful about that. Ephesians 4.28 says, Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their hands, that they what? may have something to share with those in need. One of the redemptive qualities of your work is that you would move away from the the consumption and the hoarding of what you think is yours, or in this example of stealing, but saying, I work so that I can share with those who are in need. And I think in order to do that, it all of a sudden puts this redemptive quality in whatever you're doing. If you have an ability to take what you're doing and to share with those in need, Another amazing book on the subject is called Domestic Monastery by Ronald Rollheiser. He's a Catholic writer, and he says this, there's rich spirituality in these principles. And he says this, stay inside your commitments. Be faithful. Your place of work is a seminary. Your work is a sacrament. Your family is a monastery. Your home is a sanctuary. Stay inside them. Don't betray them. Learn what they are teaching you without constantly looking for life elsewhere and without constantly believing that God is elsewhere. God is in your job. Again, without that caveat that we already talked about, the chances are God is very much in your work. And and the whole premise of his book is that the way... A monastery's work is they interrupt your, your, what you're doing, your work with a bell. And that bell calls you to prayer or calls you to meditation on scripture. And he says, your life can do that. Your life can consistently call you back to prayer and reliance and dependence on God. Also something to really point out, which again, growing up, this is kind of the only thing I ever heard about. And sometimes people now actually don't talk about it at all is that if your work is the place you will spend more of your life doing anything other than sleep, then it is also where you engage in mission. Your job is where God wants the gospel to show up. And like I said, for for years, it's kind of the only thing people talked about work being good for, but now I feel like it's not talked about enough. So what does it look like for you to be able to bear witness to Jesus Christ in the midst of your work? What does it look like for you to be unashamed of the gospel, serving a God who is unashamed of you? 1 Thessalonians 4.10 says, Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business. That's a word for someone in here this morning. (laughs) And work with your hands, just as we told you. Listen to this. So that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anyone. This is, this is Paul's missiology. He says, work and do it well. And when you work, do it in such a way that actually wins the respect of outsiders. That's his language for those who are outside the way of Jesus. And so not just what you do in terms of a career, but it's how you do it that has a missional component to it. The next thing about our work is that because work showed up before the curse did, before sin did, your work has dignity to it. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness that they may rule. I know it sounds, it may, it may feel hard if you're kind of working on entry, kind of an entry level job or you're working minimum wage, but believe it or not, you are actually working to rule and reign alongside with God. If you're staying at home with your kids, you are very much ruling alongside God to create a kingdom of heaven environment in your home. When you show up, if you have employees and you're in your boss, you're creating an atmosphere and a culture 
but do it in such a way that reflects the reality of the garden, reflects the reality of new creation. Again, Keller says, in the beginning, then, God worked. Work was not a necessary evil that came into the picture later or something human beings were created to do, but that was beneath the great God himself. No, God worked for the sheer joy of it. I thought, what, what an appropriate prayer just to say, Lord, would you help me find joy in what I do? And even if it's for a season, even if it's, you're, you're simultaneously praying for something new, <laughs> Lord, while I'm here, would you help me find the joy that can exist in adding this? It's important, like I pointed out, it's not till Genesis 3, chapter 17, after sin, God shows up and he's addressing Adam and Eve and he curses two things. He curses the serpent and he curses the ground. A lot of times we think he cursed Adam and he cursed Eve. He did not. He cursed that which where they came from. Right? It's, they came from the soil. The soil became cursed. Verse 17, chapter 3 says, Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since that is where you're taken. So, not to like overly romanticize work. I understand, I understand kind of the cultural narrative, right? We're, we're just working until we don't have to. We're working for the weekend, or we... You know, we work to live. But I think also there's, because of that, we focus so much on original sin, we forget around original blessing. Again, Rabbi Heschel says that labor is a blessing. Toil is the misery of man. So where can you see the good, dignified labor that God has invited you into? Um, and there's, there's a lot of jokes about millennial and Gen Z about like how we would like a lot of pay for a little bit of effort. I hear this a lot from like Gen Xers and boomers. Um, and there may be some truth to that. Uh, but I would encourage you specifically, if you're kind of a part of a younger generation, prove them wrong. In Lamentations it says, it is good for you to bear the yoke in your youth. There's something if you're young in here, listen, if you wanna work 25 hours a week remote and make six figures, Good for you. But can I encourage you, regardless of what you think your perks and benefits and income is, the labor itself, the work itself, is what God has invited you into. So enter into it with joy, as worship, as witness, as a redemptive ability to show the goodness of God, which leads to our last point about work, is that God sees work as worship. A matter of fact, in Genesis chapter 2, when it says that God put Adam in the garden to work it, that word in Hebrew is actually the same word for worship. Worship and work in the Hebrew actually can be used as the same exact word. There is no differentiation. There can be, but it shouldn't be. That our work can be worshiped to the Lord. This is Colossians 3.17, right? And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God through the Father through Him. Whatever you do, when you open up your emails tomorrow morning, may it be worship to the Lord. When you step into the board meeting, may it be worship to the Lord. When you start that new design project, when you sell the next house as a realtor, as you teach your class tomorrow morning, as you change that diaper at three in the morning. I mean, think about your life and your context and would your prayer just begin to start saying, Lord, may this be worship to you. John Mark Homer in his book, Garden City, says, Our job is to make the invisible God visible, to mirror and mimic what he is like to the world. We can glorify God by doing our work in such a way that we make the invisible God visible by what we do and how we do it. So simply put, kind of in, in conclusion to our work element, what if the only picture people have of God is how you work? And that's not, that's not a condemning statement. For me, hopefully, it's a, it's a curious one. It's an imaginative one. What would it look like for you to show up in your place of work for that to be a window to show the invisible God as a visible reality to the world around you? And as we transition to talking about rest, specifically around the practice of Sabbath, um, 
I, I want to just kind of give a little bit of a hinge here. Because one thing that I, I have found in terms of doing my work really well is that I'm not my best at work if I have no margin. If I'm constantly stressed, if I feel constantly just under pressure. Also, that leads into my inability to enter the rest. Uh, a year ago, Sam Larson, a friend of mine, uh, uh, gave me a book called At Your Best by Carrie Newhoff. Um, and in the book, it's a great book. The, the premise, and this is the premise of a lot of books, is that you essentially have three or four hours window of your day where you're at your best. And to use that three or four hour window to actually do the things that matter most. Don't use them for emails or meetings. Do your creative entrepreneurial work, your, your work around your family and things like that when you are at your best. But in the book, he has a seg segment on how to say no well, which I think is kind of an unforgotten, it, it's a forgotten, unutilized tool in terms of making sure you're not overdoing it. And so I just wanted to share, for whatever it's worth, just a couple of quick slides on some scripts of how to say no specific. Some of you guys are good at saying no, some of you guys are not. And so I, I'm not gonna read all of these, but if you wanna take a picture, you can. This is just like, he just literally writes out some scripts of how to say no that I think are actually kind of brilliant. The first one being, maybe I'm not the right person. <laughs> Secondly, I'm in a full season. Uh, thirdly, is talking about, um, just kind of here are some resources in that. Um, and then kind of short, kind, but firm responses are great. Um, I'm sorry, that's not going to work. <laughs> you don't get to really use that one on your boss probably, but. <laughs> um, and then lastly, just he kind of gives some like question and answer kind of worksheets. What are your greatest contributions to the organization that you're a part of? What meetings will you no longer be a part of or ask to be excused from? Which meetings will you shorten? How much time each day will you devote to email, routine, administrative tasks? And what are other things you can eliminate that are not critical to your most important responsibilities? All, all of this, again, it's very, just very practical skills. And my hope is that you would just, even just take a look at your calendar and say, how am I using my time? Is this my greatest contribution, not only to my work, but to the kingdom of God? Is this my best use of the greatest slice of pie of my life, other than rest, to give unto the Lord. Next, let's talk a little bit about Sabbath. Um, the idea of Sabbath and rest is one that we talk about quite often as a church, not because we think it's cool, uh, but because honestly, I think culturally, we need to be reminded of it all the time. We poorly engage in the practice of rest and Sabbath. So without wanting to assume that everyone is familiar with this, I want to just give a little bit of a primer here. The word Sabbath is the principle of taking a day off every seven days. Uh, it did not show up in the Mosaic Law, as some people like to think. It's just kind of part of the, kind of the Judeo covenant. It showed up in the garden. Sabbath is a part of the grand narrative of God. Sabbath in the Hebrew means to stop. And that's its technical term. You stop what you are doing. And there's all sorts of dynamics into terms of what we do in our Sabbath. But I want to just begin there, that in order to Sabbath well, God invites you once a week, but some would theorize once a day as you fall asleep, to stop, to stop what you're doing. Eugene Peterson points out that in the Genesis poem, when it summarizes a day, it says, and there is evening and there is morning. So according to the Jewish poem, rest starts your day. Your day does not begin with work, it begins with rest. And this is again a radically revolutionary topic to a nation who's recently been enslaved. So when God gets them to the desert and he gives them the Ten Commandments, the, the commandment that has more written on any other one is the Sabbath. Why? It's probably the hardest for them to grasp. Just stop. You don't have to continue. You can let down that load. You can be able to just sit with him. And I think that we need to recapture just how radical of an idea this is. A.J. Swoboda in his book, Subversive Sabbath, says, the problem with the Sabbath is there are huge rewards and incentives for not actually doing it. <laughs> the modern industrial complex generally rewards Sabbath breaking as a rule. And this isn't just in kind of like um, kind of in the corporate environment. This is within the church as well. We celebrate those who break the Sabbath. 
The Psalm 46.10 reminds us this, that we must be still and know that I am God. I would argue, and we won't do it for the scope of this sermon, that there is a sense of who God is that you cannot know other than from being still. There's a lot you can know from God in, in, in your work and in your movement and in your doing. I believe there is an element of who God is that can only be known when you stop. Again, Comer in Garden City says this, that's why Sabbath is an expression of faith. Faith that there is a creator and he's good. We are his creation. This is his world. We live under his roof, drink his water, eat his food, breathe his oxygen. So on the Sabbath, we just don't take a day off from work. We take a day off from toil. We give him all our fear and anxiety and stress and worry. We let go. We stop ruling and subduing and we just be. We remember our place in the universe so that we never forget there is a God and I am not him. That is what Sabbath does for us. And that may seem extreme, but the reality is, is most of us don't fear a pharaoh that we have to submit to, many of us have started to believe a lie that we ourselves are the pharaoh. It is us to control and to rule and to gain and to, and to have and to, to create this excess. And when we Sabbath, it is a place, it's a time for us to get back in line of, I am not God. He is my provider. These are his gifts. I am his son or his daughter. And that when we stop, it moves into the next point of Sabbath, and it's to actually rest. And that's, this is where it gets tricky. Some of us are like, okay, I can get, I can kind of stop, I can, you know, turn off my emails or whatever. But entering into rest is an art. Matthew eleven thirty eight, 38, sorry, 28, is Jesus' invitation when he says to follow me. He says, come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is, I, I love this verse because this is the paradox of rest and work in God's economy. A yoke is a, is a tool of labor. A yoke, if you put it on oxen, is to till soil. It's tough Work And Jesus says, come with me. If you follow me, the work you do feels different. You find rest for your soul. And we know that that we're carrying the wrong yoke when the things that we're doing, it doesn't mean that you're not doing anything. It just means that the thing that you're doing is it producing rest or is it producing worry and anxiety and burnout. And And my friends, just so you know, pastors sometimes are the worst at this. So don't just be ever like, must be nice, you know? Like, you just, you only work one day a week. Good for you, Benji. <laughs> there, there's something when your bottom line becomes people's salvations that drives pastors to burn out. And so this is, I, I, I need this sermon maybe more than most of you. Sabbath has become something I, I fight for, not because I enjoy it, which I've come to, But because when I don't, my soul becomes lean. And that is is at a cost to you, to my family, and to me. Stephanie Paulsell says, The Christian practice of honoring your body, which, by the way, Sabbath is. It is, the reason I like Sabbath too is it's not like a, it's not mental ascension with your worship. It's not even, it is physical embodied worship. You are stopping what you are physically doing. And she says this, the Christian practice of honoring body is born of the confidence that our bodies are made in the image of God's own goodness. As the place where the divine presence dwells, our bodies are worth, worthy of care and blessing. It is through our bodies that we participate in God's activity in the world. And so just, just a quick note on this. The reason that I think the Sabbath is so important um, is because it deals with your body. And we live, it's funny, we, we live in a culture that on one level, I'm speaking in culture, I'm speaking here on the coast, in Sinaitis, that moves from valuing the body to worshiping it. And I think what the Sabbath does is it reminds us of the fragility of our body, the frailty of it, 
but not in a way just to get it back up to reach its peak performance, but for actually just to rest, to honor it, to recognize, oh, this is, this is good. And it, it is funny how many um, corporate podcasts and self-help books champion rest now, but their reason is always you can do more, which is true. Like, you can do more if you rest. If, you, if you're not a Christian and you just Sabbath, I guarantee you, you'll probably see benefits up the wazoo in your life. Wazoo is a Hebrew word, by the way, for <laughs> benefit. Um, I'm literally, the Seventh-day Adventists, by the way, um, are, are people, they follow Jesus, but they, they hold to many of the Jewish laws, specifically around the Sabbath, so Saturday is the actual Shabbat. Um, and, and a couple of studies that I found really interesting. One, studying different subcultures throughout the world, found that the Seventh-day Adventists were the happiest subculture in the world. Just pure joy. Just because they, they practice this thing. They also found that, on average, Seventh-day Adventists live 10 more years than the average person. Which is interesting, if you take around 70 years as an average lifespan, it's like they're getting all of their Sabbath back at the end of it. And so... And, and, and I say that not to just, you know, tell you that we're becoming Seventh-day Adventists, <laughs> but um, just to say, there, there are just practical, logistical benefits to Sabbath. But I, I, my hope this morning is that that's not why we do it. We do it because God did it. We do it because it allows us to be reminded that He is God and that we are not. Which brings up a really interesting question. Was God tired when He took a Sabbath? Like, if God rested on the seventh day, was he like, whoo, man, that was a lot. Jupiter, crazy, you know? Like, I got kind of tired, I made stingrays, I don't know, I'm sorry about that one, or whatever. Like, he's not just like looking, he's like, wow, man, just exhausted like we do. And so if God wasn't tired when he rested, why did he rest? Which leads to our third point, it's to stop, it's to rest, but it's also to delight. We believe that God took a Sabbath to delight in what he made. This is my favorite part of Sabbath, by the way. We Sabbath to practice delight alongside God in his goodness. And remember, humanity's first day in the garden was a Sabbath day. They're taking in. They're not working the garden yet. They're just delighting with God in all that he has made. Um, There's this tradition in ancient Judaism where the father of the household would wake up their children with a spoonful of honey and he'd say, how sweet is the rest of God? And they'd wake up with this, with this, and love Sabbath is so physical, so embodied, where it's like this sweetness on your lips, how sweet is the rest of God? And so Sabbath is a time for us to delight. You'll notice if you read the Gospels, Jesus gets in trouble a lot on the Sabbath. He gets in trouble for healing people. In one instance, in Matthew 27, he gets in trouble because they're picking heads of grain as they're walking. It's presumably this really, like, beautiful scene. They're walking in a grain field, and they're eating and talking, and they're, like, up in arms because... Because the Pharisees are saying, you're breaking the Sabbath, and this is, again, so... This is so critical, and we we had to be leery of this, too. The Sabbath became a religious rule to keep, not a divine grace to be received. And this is what Jesus says. He said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And so Sabbath is when, in the words of Eugene Peterson, we play and pray. So some simple questions. If if you've never Sabbathed before, and I hope that this week you would. Chances are most of you are doing some sort of vocational work, whether, again, whether it's from home or online or you're a student or you're working. Chances are most of us in this room, my chances upwards of 90%, are not taking a proper Sabbath. And so all I'm asking you to do is experiment this week. But one of the things you're to do is you're to stop, you're to rest. By the way, that matters in terms of who you are. So simple way, Rick Warren said this one time, if you work with your hands, rest with your mind. And if you work with your mind, rest with your hands. So rest will look different based on your age stage, your personality. If you're married, the chances are your Sabbath will look different than your spouse in terms of what fills you up, what gives you rest. Which leads into the next thing, the delight will look different for you as well. 
What gives me delight on my Sabbath is largely different than what gives Jen delight on her Sabbath. As a matter of fact, we actually take two different days of Sabbath. And one of the reasons for that is because of our kids' age stage, I can't have my phone off and be able to be an accountable parent when they're at school. And so we have two different days. Also, Sabbath means different things for us. So Jen's Sabbath is on Monday. It's her chance to kind of take the whole day of Sunday, which is a huge day for us. And she's able to just kind of rest and recoup. For me, I can't rest on, on Monday because I'm still kind of reeling from the weight of Sunday and I'm thinking about the next week. So Friday is my Sabbath day. And so on Sabbath, we play and we pray. There's a couple ways that we do this. I'll just kind of give you a little insight into mine. Uh, number one, and I kind of alluded to this, um, I turn my phone off. My staff knows this. Um, unless there's a family emergency going on or there's something that I need to adhere to, because keep in mind, Jesus did have the Sabbath interrupted to heal people. There are times where I will, I will break that rule because I believe there's a greater level of compassion that's needed. But for the most part, on Friday, I don't look at text messages or emails until from Thursday night till Friday evening, I'll turn it back on. On that day, in, in line with kind of the Jewish tradition, I will make sure that when my kids have a short day at school, which is great, I pick them up, we'll always have something sweet. They know it. We'll go and we'll find something that's pleasing, not just to the tongue, but to the eye. We'll go somewhere beautiful, and we'll have that frozen yogurt. We'll have donuts. And we'll go sing, and we'll, and we'll say, how sweet is the presence of God? And we'll talk about this. Um, like I said, it's play and pray. So for me, when I can, I love to surf on Friday. I'm not great at it, but it's kind of the point. It's, right, it's, this, it's my time where I'm not trying to get better at something. I'm trying to enjoy and delight in God. Um, Jen, said, Jen said something to me which I found incredibly helpful in terms of how do you delight on the Sabbath? And she said this. For her, she thinks back to what used to give her delight as a child, which oftentimes is our is a window, whether you're in psychology or spirituality, into a true version of yourself before you were hindered and jaded by the world. And so just think about you as a child. What used to like, give you delight? And actually engage that same activity you would have done as a child. And it's amazing what it does if you actually approach Sabbath as a childlike window of your week to be like, man, this is like... Um, like I remember like uh, recently, even like if we'll watch like a family movie, we'll watch a movie that gave me kid, like joy as a kid, right? We'll go and watch Sandlot or we'll go watch the thing and I'm like, oh my, and it's, it's helping re-engage this part of me that we're just so quickly just told, just grow up. And Jesus keeps saying, no, you don't understand. It's the children who get my kingdom of God. And Sabbath helps us return to that, which leads to kind of the last thing I wanted to point out that worship is, or Sabbath is to stop, it's to rest, it's to delight, and it ends with the same thing that work ends with. It ends with worship. We are to worship the Lord with our Sabbath. So how do we, how do, we do this? How do we worship the Lord with the Sabbath? Well, I think the greatest thing that we can do is remember that the Sabbath is not just a day off. I'm all for day offs. I'm all for vacations. I think they're great. Um, but Sabbath is supposed to revolve around the Lord. And it's supposed for us to be detoxing from the self. Um, last quote from Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel in his book, The Sabbath, says, Six days a week we wrestle with the world, wringing profit from the earth, on the Sabbath, we especially care for the seeds of eternity planted in the soul. The world has our hands, but our soul belongs to someone else. Six days a week, we, we seek to dominate the world, and on the seventh day, we try to dominate the self. Hebrews 4 is one of the most fascinating chapters on Sabbath. This is post-Jesus coming, his death, resurrection, ascension. And the author of Hebrews is kind of recounting the major pillars of the Jewish faith and pointing to how Jesus fulfills them all. And in Hebrews chapter 4, he gets to the topic of Sabbath. And he says, For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. So all those who believe like, Sabbath is old covenant, we don't do this. Verse 9 says, There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their work, just as God did from His. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. This is another thing. Again, this is why grace is opposed to earning, not effort. We are to make every effort. What? 
to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. So what does it mean to enter into a rest? Well, what he's pointing to, and I hope you get this, Jesus is our Sabbath rest. More than Sabbath being a day, please catch this, Jesus is our Sabbath. Jesus was always the goal of Sabbath. It's where we find delight. It's where we stop. It's where we find rest. Mark Slomka, who's my pastor, Messianic Jew, I was talking to him this week about Sabbath, and he said this, Through Jesus we have the ultimate gift. He fulfills the law and restores it as a gift. He becomes our incarnate Sabbath in whom we can enjoy rest seven days a week. I don't think he withdraws the gift of the Sabbath invitation so much as he guarantees its meaning and promise for us. Because now the Sabbath is a day of rest and a person to rest in. So I'm going to invite the worship team to, to come up. Um, and what I'd like for you to do, I, I talked a little bit about your work, but um, I would love for you to consider a few things in terms of incorporating a Sabbath into your life. Um, the, the rigid religiosity seems to be something that Jesus adamantly attacked. But the Sabbath itself is something he invited people into. And so the, the goal here is not, and even when I talk about mine or when you read other people's books, it's not something for you to copy. It's something for you to think through. What does Sabbath look like for you? I do think there's something about choosing a day. And if you can't choose a day yet, choose a half day. But choose a time for you to do that. Secondly, think about the work that you are engaged with and what does Sabbath from that work look like? Um, chances are, the most practical thing you can do is not engage technology. Again, I recognize if you have small kids, you're, 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 you're a caretaker, there's some people like, I can't turn off my phone. But even just having certain um, opportunities or turning on Do Not Disturb or things like that, just saying, I'm not going to be run by this thing for this period of time. And a lot of times you can just let people know in advance, like, hey, if you need to reach me, you can do it this way, but I won't be, re be able to be reached in this in this kind of manner. Um, the next thing I would encourage you is look, work through that grid. Am I stopping? Am I resting in Jesus? What am I doing to play and pray, to delight, to return to that childlike faith that I have in Him? And how is this not just a day off where I binge Netflix? How is this a day for me to be like, Lord, this helps me come back to you, the gift that you are? Because the reality, and as a pastor, I hope you're in my heart, we need rest if we are to grow into full, mature followers of Jesus. We need work and to do it in a redemptive way if we are to mature into Christian, or sorry, followers of Christ in a mature way. And these two things, our rest and our work, this takes up the majority of our life. And so my friends, would we reconsider, reimagine, prayerfully engage how we do those things so that they form our soul and our spirit? Would you stand to your feet with me? Um, three books that I just recommend. There are many. But um, On Work, Every Good Endeavor by Tim Keller. If you're struggling, especially how do I find redemptive quality in my work, read that book. Um, in terms of Sabbath, stop, resting, if you've not read Ruthless Elimination of Her yet, it will mess you up in the best possible way. Um, some of you guys are laughing, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Subversive Sabbath is a more scholarly book, but it's very, very good. I'm written by A.J. Swoboda, who spoke here last year. Um, so just if you want to keep, like maybe that's one of my practices I need to really engage with. Just some further reading that you guys can do on that. I'm just going to go ahead and pray and then we're going to end in some worship. Father, we thank you that in the garden you showed us how to work and rest. Lord, and by doing that you showed us how to be human. So Lord, I pray for the people in this room who come in here and their relationship to space and time has been skewed by the culture around them. I pray that it would be redeemed by the goodness and by the shepherding nature of your heart. Help us to know what it means to work redemptively and to rest well, to stop and to delight in who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just let the Holy Spirit speak to you.
Jesus said you are 